At the beginning of this video, my guest Remco will explain the setup we will use to generate and measure audio signals, and then we will see how different filters will change the audio output. Remco will also explain when and how we can use these filters to improve audio quality. That's a very important part of this video. So let's start with our setup and what you may need if you are interested in audio processing. So uh, in order to develop some DSP uh, applications without writing any source code, um, all you will need is the development board, uh, a Windows PC, because the software only runs on Windows. And of course, you want to verify that your algorithms do what they do. And really only what you need would be a signal generator and something to measure the output. It could be an oscilloscope, it could be as simple as a voltmeter. But if you do this all day long, um, you want to automate this work and then you come up with specialized measurement systems. And the, the most well-known measurement system in the world is a company called Audio Precision and they make these boxes. And these boxes have on one side um, analog outputs or digital outputs. So they are essentially um, a combination of signal generators and signal analyzers. And the, at the right hand side, you've got all the, the audio inputs. So you literally connect the generator output to your device on the test, and then its output goes back to the inputs. And then um, the software that runs with this device knows the signal it's generating. So it knows what to expect from the, from the device on the test. And that's what it analyzes on the input. For instance, if it generates a one kilohertz sine wave, it knows that there will be some gain, there may be some phase shift, some distortion, but it knows that the signal coming back should be around one kilohertz. Mm -hmm. And that's what these machines are specialized for. Mm -hmm. So uh, can we see the software? So this screen shows um, what the device is inputting and outputting. So you, we are sending the, uh, the signal out, the, the generated signal out on unbalanced outputs. It can also do balanced or digital or all that. And it's coming back through unbalanced inputs. Um, currently I'm listening on channel two and three. That's not that important. Um, you can have a filter on the output. So we are sending a DC coupled output. Um, and we're uh, looking at a bandwidth of 192 kilohertz sampling rate, so 90 kilohertz signal, which is more than enough for audio. And then the next panels are the signal that the generator is uh, outputting. That could be a sine wave, it could be a square wave, you could even send an audio file. And as soon as you turn it on, it will be um, sent to the device. And then on the input, there are a couple of settings on, on how long the device is averaging. Um, and filters you can put on the input and all that. Mm -hmm. um, so right, right now we will only hear one tone, 440 hertz. Exactly, exactly. And as soon as I enable that, and I will turn the speaker on for a moment. Okay. Yeah. But so I guess will... to check your audio application or filter or, or audio processing, you need to sweep through all the frequencies. It, it depends exactly on, on the kind of algorithm that you're currently uh, investigating. So one of the first things you always do is check if your device is um, free of distortion, whether it's not clipping, mm -hmm. and it, because the, even, even the power supply might not be on, right? So you just want to see that you have a clean output signal and you can look at a sine wave for a long time, but you will not really see distortion. So you usually look at the signal in the, in the FFT domain. Mm -hmm. And this machine is doing FFTs uh, in real uh, in real time, but also on an oscilloscope, you could probably take uh, a couple of FFTs and average them out to get a low enough noise floor. So here we see the 440 hertz mm -hmm. fundamental come back. If I set this to dBs, we'll see that the, the fundamental is at zero dB and the second harmonic is here at minus 80 dB. Third harmonic is minus 105 or something. So if we add them all up, um, we can measure this in percents or in dBs. We'll see that the overall harmonic distortion of this signal is 76 dB, which is not great, but it's an evaluation board. You know, it's, it's not high-end audio. So um, it, means, least... it means like uh, the output is almost the same as the uh, yeah. input. The output is clean and, and the sum of distortion and noise is 0.015%. Uh, so if if it would be if it would be perfect, then it's like zero percent, correct? Exactly. And um, if it's like completely wrong, then it's like hundred percent. Yeah. 
one of the tests that you always do with, with a piece of uh, measurement gear like this is that you do a loopback test. So you plug the generator straight into the input and you measure it by itself. And um, this machine will come to about minus 115 dB. Um, there are more expensive versions that do about minus 125 dB. And that's that's essentially the reference for audio. I mean, our, our ears don't really hear any distortion mm -hmm. below minus 80 dB, but that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be better than that. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. So uh, now, uh, what is next? So, so the next thing is, this is essentially the, the basic view of how you do measurements, and it's called bench mode. It literally shows you the inputs and the outputs. But the machine um, has, has a, a different way of working, and this is called um, sequence mode. And what it does there, so we'll load a file with sequence mode. So you can save the presets or something like that? Yeah, you can save the the, the whole set of meting, uh, measurements. So here in, in preset, uh, sorry, here in, in sequence mode, we see it's still exactly the same thing, output configuration, input configuration. Mm -hmm. But now on the left, there is literally a whole set of measurements that will be performed one after another. So wow. first it checks that the signal is there, then it checks the level, then it checks the THD, then it runs frequency response. And if, if we're going to measure a filter, we will only check frequency response, but you can set up a whole sequence of measurements and it, it can run for literally like two, three hours and you just start it and you go away and the machine will literally output a report of test one failed, test two passed, test three failed. So it's, it's really developed for, for production, uh, lines. And I have a um, question. How much yeah. does it cost the hardware? Um, let's just say that uh, you could buy a very nice mid-class car for the same price. Wow. So that's like how much? I don't know. <laughs> um, think about roughly 20,000 euros. Okay. So now the setup is uh, from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, correct? Yeah. So in, in this, uh, in this little sequence, we're doing a frequency response. And, and to, to come back for the people who don't have an audio position, what we're literally doing is frequency by frequency, we're generating, let's say 100 Hertz, then 125, then 150. And then the analyzer will simply measure the amplitude in RMS. And uh, it will then plot the, uh, the received amplitude over frequency. So if and, a device yeah. is, is frequency linear, if there are no, no filters or distortions, you expect essentially a flat line. So mm -hmm. every frequency com comes back equally strong. Mm -hmm. What is the step? Um, the step is automatically generated. So we're now going from 20 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. Ah, sorry, no, I have to uh, ex explain something else. So um, there is actually no step in this measurement. There is, there is another measurement that's called um, stepped frequency sweep. Um, but this is a frequency response that is generated as a as a chirp signal and it's then deconvoluted from the chirp into the frequency domain mm -hmm. and this is called the farina sweep after uh, professor angelo farina from the university of parma who was uh, consulting for audio precision so so it kind um, of covers all the frequencies yeah okay uh so how does it sound can we play um, we'll put the, the sound on. This is something that uh, you always check once or twice, but the last thing you want to do is listen to this all day because it goes like this. Okay. <laughs> that, was, that was a really quick one, but you can also have low, uh, longer sweeps. But yeah, you can see that this sweep takes 350 milliseconds and we are able to measure from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And that's why the, uh, the sweeping method like this is so powerful. Okay, that, that, that's that's really cool. Yeah, it, yeah that's it's very, extremely very cool. fast. Yeah. Okay, now a little bit about the device, what we are going to use to um, implement some filters and this audio processing. So what do yeah. we use? We are working with a, a signal processor from analog devices and it's called the Sigma DSP. Um, and the Sigma DSP is a fixed point DSP processor. I think it's uh, something like uh, 56 bits internal um, resolution and um, the cool part about it is that you can develop algorithms without writing one single line of code um, 
normally for my work, I, I do write everything in code because there's also the housekeeping of the process that you want to work with and everything. But if you quickly want to try an algorithm, just you know, see if, if your crazy idea works. This is a really nice graphical environment that there are lots of blocks that you can just draw into this, into this uh, desktop here. And you can simply connect the signals by, you know, connecting lines. And this is, this is a fantastic quick way to develop an algorithm. Um, and that's not to say that this is a hobby project. There's actually many commercial products uh, in the market right now that, that run on software generated by this uh, graphical user interface because you can literally uh, compile it into a hex file and just flash it into the, into the processor. Um, and right now we have the processor connected by, these, uh, by a USB cable and we literally can just compile it and download it and it automatically gets flashed into the device. Okay, so we have, you have this board physically on your yeah, table and uh, this is just a software where we create our firmware or our software which we then upload to the board and yeah. we will test it. This is this is really interesting because it it's like super fast if you can just use blocks and and create these all these filters and everything. Yeah, and it's it's actually more powerful than you think in the beginning because not only do you have the audio coming in through analog or digital in and outputs, you can also sample GPIOs and you can perform um, very very um, extensive bitwise manipulations and all that. When you double click on the block, what? Just I just would like to see what is there. Yeah. So um, there are some every every one of these the blocks has a, has a little configuration thing. Uh -huh, okay. For instance, this this is a a two channel mixer because I have one channel coming in from here and from there, and I wanted to have a little switch here to switch the inputs. Mm -hmm. So what I inserted was a, a signal router. Let me see if we can expand this a little bit. Um, and as an example, this one has two tabs and the, the the button selects a number from zero to one and mm -hmm. that will then select tab zero or tab one. Mm -hmm. What do you tabs... have connected to input one and... and uh, to one? input uh, zero and one, I have connected um, the, the cable from the audio position. So that's a stereo jack going in. Mm -hmm. And the board has a second stereo jack that I connected here. So I could I could connect another microphone or another signal mm -hmm. and just switch between the two. Mm -hmm. But we are not using the second one. Are we going to use it today? We're not using the second one, um, but we could, if if we have time left over, then we can when try. we test, yeah, when we test the compressor, we might try and hook a microphone up to it. So right now, everything is kind of uh, disabled, correct? Because yeah. we can see the output is exactly the same as the input. So now we turn that on, look at the parameters. It's a low pass at 100 Hertz. So what shall we see? What shall we expect? Oh, what, what do you expect? A low pass at 100 Hertz? Uh, low pass, it means everything below 100 Hertz mm -hmm. should pass and then it should go, it should be kind of like, uh, yeah. it should go down. Yeah, I, I don't know how by... fast it should go down. I don't know how to set these parameters, but... Yeah. Well, we'll just click on append. So we leave the old measurement and we do another sweep. Oh, of course, I need to download it. Jeez. So always when you make changes, you have to download it back to... Okay. Yeah. So now you see, um, indeed, exactly as you say, at 100 Hertz, it starts to go down. And um, let me see if we go from 500k uh, at 500 hertz is about 27 dB, and at 1k it's about 40 dB. So that looks like 12 dB per decade uh, per octave. So it's a second order section, like I already said. The only thing is here you see this little hump. Mm -hmm. What do you think that is? It's it's, it's a little resonance. resonance so yeah. um, at that point, let's see the Q factor here is 1.41 and if I remember my um, control theory correctly 0.707 would be um, exactly critical Q. So we go back, we overlay the new data and now you see it go down far more critically damped, right? Okay, so what did you do? So in this in this second order section I 
change the amount of resonance that is that is in the in the coefficients. So the coefficients are made from a, a crossover frequency and an amount of Q. So the, the Q is the quality. If, if you would build a, uh, a resonator or an oscillator on purpose, you would have as you would like to have as high quality as you can. Um, if you're trying to build a filter, you want the quality to be critically damped, which usually is a means a Q of 0 0.707 or square root of two. And with this, so now, now you have a nicely rolling off filter, but you can play with the Q. For instance, if you want um, maximum flatness up until 100 hertz and then the fall off, you would choose a Q of uh, 1.4 or even higher. So you can see that you can, you can play with these coefficients and, and directly see the result in the frequency response. Okay. Can, can we make it like, for example, faster? You mean steeper? Mm -hmm. Um, if you want to make it steeper, then you have to add more orders. So mm -hmm. then you would have to insert another block. But uh, let's see, we can do that. Let's make a little space for this block. Then we copy it. And then we have to find the lines, remove the lines. And we just add another one. So we send that to the board. And let's append it so we overlay the plot. Mm. And now you see that our new one is much steeper. So let's try the different uh, filter. So, what yeah. is... so um, we will turn off the low pass and the second one as well. And here we have a peaking filter. So it's, it's another combination of coefficients. And what it will do is, uh, let me see the frequency I put in. So I put in 440 hertz with a Q of uh, 0.707, of course. And then if we measure the frequency what? response, oh. okay. this is exactly what happens here. So um, if you would have, um, for instance, between the woofer and the tweeter, you would have a little bit of a dead zone that, that neither one is really um, contributing. And you want to emphasize that frequency part a little bit. You would you would put a peaking filter there. So when you say so, woofer and and the other one, I don't know. So these mm -hmm. are different uh, speakers, correct? The yeah, woofer so is the, the big one, and then yeah, the woofer and, produces the bass. The, the tweeter or the mid range produces the mid and the, and the high frequencies, and they should be usually factory tuned in a way that that they really cooperate. Mm -hmm. But if for whatever reason there is a frequency uh, area. The, like like another example, if you are um, listening to a movie and you you find it's hard to understand people, what you could do is you could move this this peaking filter to the speech area, mm -hmm. two to four kilohertz, mm -hmm. and the speech would become a little bit more intelligible. Mm -hmm. And how how do you control the sharpness again? It's the Q, yeah. I guess. So it is the Q. Um, it's currently set to a very um, friendly 0 0.707. If you change it. But we change it to, uh, let's say, 1.4 or... No, How high it can be? I think... Um, so here is limited to 14. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, anything over 4 is, is already a little bit crazy, but um, they limit you to 14. Mm -hmm. So I um, And when I Q hold. is 0, it means like... It... It's essentially not doing anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So let's overlay this plot. And mm -hmm. you see now that... Um, it's actually, it, it, it hasn't become higher, it just has become narrower. So, mm -hmm. because ah. we specified the gain at this point, mm -hmm. and the Q specifies essentially the 3 dB bandwidth of, of this little peaking filter. Mm -hmm. And where where do you set the... Uh... The center frequency? No, no frequency, but the um, top of the... The peak. gain, yeah. Yeah, gain, yeah it's gain. So the gain is set here, and again, ah, it's okay. limited by okay. by the okay, algorithm because they don't they don't want you to put in a hundred dB. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the other thing that limits it is um, the headroom that you have. So if, if your signal comes in at, my, at at zero dB of S full scale, it's uh, clear that you cannot add anything more because you would you would go into clipping. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a little bit of overlay, but. Um, 
yeah you you let's if, if we move it down to let's say uh 6 db we measure it again you see that it mm -hmm. goes down here and if you put it below zero what will happen and um, that is a little bit depending on who implements the algorithm but let's just try it yeah. <laughs> so it perfectly goes the other way <laughs> Okay. So this this is literally what's called a parametric EQ. You you have the parameters of frequency and the parameters of gain and the parameters of of the width or, or the Q of the the peaking filter. So you can imagine as an acoustic engineer, if if you measure a non-perfect room or speaker or anything, these are your tools. You you have a couple of these so-called biquads at your disposal, and you can you can emphasize or de-emphasize certain frequencies. Um, and when in in the, the part where it went down here, it's um, it's still called a peaking filter, although the gain is is negative. But if there would be a frequency that you really want to suppress, you would use a notch filter, which is mm -hmm. uh, the That's next block. Is the next yeah. one, yeah. So we we disable this, and we put the notch in, and the notch is essentially a very similar construction, but it it is very high in quality. Mm -hmm. So you see that from zero to B, this literally notches down to minus 55 db and probably steeper if we would measure slower so this is for example like if you would like to um, get rid of 50 hertz or 60 hertz exactly exactly or, or a crazy resonance or um you have a system that is very susceptible to um to a screen you would notch out uh, 15,650 hertz if i'm not mistaken what are the parameters of this filter when you double click on the block yeah uh, here's the notch. So it literally has uh, it, it has frequency in Q again, so you you can um, make it even steeper if you want mm -hmm. or, or less steep. But um, the there is no parameter for the gain here, so the gain literally is minus infinity, mm -hmm. as good as it can get, of course. And then frequency is one okay one yeah. kilohertz. Okay, and what is the last one? Ah, last one is the shelf. Yeah, so uh, back to the shelving uh, EQ. So if, if you would make this a five band EQ, if, if you remember from the 80s that you had these, these little uh, sliders on the boxes, the lowest and the highest one would always be a shelf and the, the other ones would be peaking filters. Mm -hmm. Shelf, it means it only touches the uh, like mm, lowest or the highest frequencies. Correct. A shelving filter, um, so a low shelf starts at a certain gain and then it transitions to another gain. Mm -hmm. And the difference is, is what you call the gain of the filter. Mm -hmm. So a high shelf will go up, uh, will be 0 dB, then it will add X dB and it will not come down like a peaking filter, it will just go on mm -hmm. forever. Mm -hmm. That's why you would like to have it at the beginning or at the end. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this would be high shelf would be on the end and low shelf yes. would be at the beginning. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. well, of course, you can put a low shelf at the beginning, but then you've, you've literally offset your entire frequency mm -hmm. range. So then you have to keep in mind for all your other filters that you have to add 6 dB or whatever you have added. So usually it, it just makes sense to put a low shelf here and a high shelf there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what else is there? Uh, do we have something else there? No. Yeah, so... What we've done so far is is what I call linear filtering. So mm -hmm. these these things have coefficients, um, but it should be amplitude independent. The the filtering will will add or subtract something in the frequency domain until you you clip you know outside of your your dynamic range. So clip um, it means it the output is going to be yeah. So you you damaged. add you add amplitude, but you run out of amplitude because of um, you run out of number of bits to code, or your amplifier is running into voltage rails, or even your loudspeaker is running into the physical structure. So mm -hmm. at some point, you know, it's just over. Mm -hmm. um, but all of this is signal independent. And um, what we will move to now will be signal dependent filtering. And this is just the next step in, in evolution of algorithms. So first we learned how to filter stuff. Um, but to do level dependent filtering gives us um, psychoacoustic possibilities where as soon as you, you realize that depending on the level of the sound, you can change the filtering, you can do lots of crazy stuff. Oh, so this is what I would like to do. <laughs> yeah. 
So one, one of the classic um, implementations is a so-called loudness algorithm. And loudness is essentially um, the low shelf and the high shelf we just talked about, but now depending on the level. So um, this comes down to research about how the human ear works. And the research is done by uh, two a gentleman called Fletcher and Munson. And I think in every high school uh, science book, there are these curves and, and um, we can find an image and, and uh, put it in the, in, the, in the video where it shows that depending on the level of the sound, your sensitivity to, to certain frequencies increases or decreases. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's in general, it's a little bit of a bathtub curve. So, um, and then um, the Fletcher Munson curves are about threshold, not about sensitivity. So when the, the curve goes down, the threshold for hearing that frequency is very low, which mm -hmm. means you are very sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. So we are most sensitive to three, four kilohertz, probably um, uh, evolutionary um, chicken and egg problem, right? So yeah. We are, we are sensitive to speech, so our ears um, pick up that the best, or other way around, our voices uh, operate at that frequency because our ears work that way. So um, lower and higher frequencies, we are less sensitive to, so that's, that's the static situation, but it changes dynamically as well. So um, when the sound becomes um, louder, we become more sensitive to, uh, or, or less sensitive to the mid-range and more sensitive to the higher range. So. Um, this this bath curve, a uh, bathtub uh, curve, we have to change it according to the level. So oh, wow. what I've what I've done here again, this is the input. Forget about this. And um, then I'm splitting the signal here, and uh, the gain is not important here. So left and right still go into a uh, low shelving filter and a high shelving filter, but this filter has an input for how stark, how, how strong it should be filtering. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing here is I'm, I'm taking the left signal. We should probably take left and right, but it doesn't matter. And I'm running it into an RMS block and, and um, or a, a peak finder block. So mm -hmm. on a sine wave, it just does a peak hold. And then on these peak holds, it's running it, uh, a boxcar averaging. So um, the output of the filter will literally tell you the amplitude uh, in RMS levels of the signal. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it doesn't tell you the momentary amplitude that goes through these little lines, but it's essentially um, peak detected and then low integrated low pass filtered. So this filter will literally tell you the level of the signal. And this is the signal itself. So depending on the level of the signal, there will be a change in the uh, frequency response of the signal. So it depends like if it's uh something louder then uh, you will be doing uh, one thing and if it's uh, quieter yeah. then you will be doing different thing yeah so if you if you would like to uh, measure a filter like that uh, we need more one. complicated well you still setup. only need you only need a frequency generator and uh, a multimeter but now you need to do a uh, a sweep not only over all the frequencies, but also over all the levels, right? Mm -hmm. so let's clear the data here. So um, when we look at, we're still doing frequency response. Mm -hmm. So we look at the plot. We're plotting again from 20 hertz to 20 mm -hmm. kilohertz. So we will just find this bathtub curve. But now we do a so-called nested plot where um, we also sweep the generator level. So we start at minus 40 dB. And then we do the whole frequency response mm -hmm. Then it jumps to, um, let's say, uh, minus 32 dB and it measures the curve again and again and again. So mm -hmm. imagine if you have to do this by hand, you'll be here all week. But um, if you have a, an automated setup like this, it, it happens very quickly. So if I start this, there's the first response, there's the second, third, fourth, and the fifth. So um, if you look at the signal level, you can see, of course, the level comes up, right? Because we are sweeping the, the level itself. Mm -hmm. But you can also see that the frequency response is changing a little mm -hmm. bit. Even in the game plot, the game plot shows it a little bit uh, clearer. Um, this algorithm not only changes the, the EQ, but it also changes the gain, the overall gain a little bit in, in exact accordance to these Fletcher-Munson curves. So, if a signal is very loud, 
it adds a lot of bass and, and a lot of high frequencies. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you would make static filtering like we just did a minute ago, and you would turn down the sound all the way, it would sound like it has no bass. Mm -hmm. So this, this compensates for the human ear and, and it's, it's psychoacoustic nonlinearity. So quiet sounds now get more bass until you turn them up and then you'll see um, there's still a little bit of bass added but barely any high frequency. And at the end, we return to a normalized situation where it's just completely flat. I had no idea there is so much theory behind audio. <laughs> well, um, audio engineering is, is, of course, very simple. Um, you have to make something linear and you have to make sure that you don't distort and that you transmit the entire frequency range. But when you go into algorithms, you literally open yourself up to the whole field of psychoacoustics. And it's, that's essentially what makes it so interesting for me. So this, this is a very simple example of how the human ear processes things very differently. And you have to add essentially signal dependent um, equalization to make it sound to the ear like it's linear. But th there are thousands of examples. I mean, um, MP3 is a perfect example where people have done a very detailed research of the things we cannot hear when other signals are there. And because of this, they know exactly how much data they can throw away and, and how to um, make a sound encoding that is that is very efficient. Mm -hmm. So if our ears were perfect computers, we would immediately detect that there's missing information. But because we are um, humans with psychoacoustic uh, properties, for instance, if, if um, the, the classic example is, is noise masking. So if, if, uh, if I'm whispering to you and suddenly a plane flies by, you're not going to hear me. So the MP3 algorithm immediately decides, okay, um, we can completely forget about the, the whispering and just encode the most loud yeah. parts. So, um, those, those are the things where, um, algorithms come into play. So, um, audio engineering for me for a long time was building very nice amplifiers and make everything linear. But when you move into into algorithms, you can do crazy stuff, and and um, that's that's really the next level. What makes it interesting for me? You can make um, anything dependent on anything. So with this with this uh, Sigma Studio, for instance, I would be able to read a GPIO pin through an ADC and do something. I don't know. I could read a light sensor and figure out that it's evening because the light is going down, and then I would be able to do something else, turn mm -hmm. the volume down or something. Um, I, I so algorithms in general, I just make something dependent on something else. So this is what makes difference between expensive audio setup and cheap one. Um, in, in some ways, um, I would say the, the really expensive audio stuff, um, is for a big part, just, um, the, the rule that there is no, dis no replacement for displacement. So bigger speakers move more air with less distortion and all that. So, um, that's one way you can go. So, so high end audio usually doesn't play with algorithms, um, because their customers just want undistorted, pure, um, mm -hmm. signal. But if you think of, let's say a Sonos loudspeaker, it's a tiny little loudspeaker and it, it plays really loud. It does a lot of algorithmic stuff, obviously, mm -hmm. in, in order to make sure that, um, with an internal volume of three or four liters, it sounds like a loudspeaker that has mm -hmm. uh, 35 liters okay, and the things they do are very impressive. Okay, I understand. Because this this was my next question. Like, you know, if you have this kind of algorithm in your uh, audio generating device, mm -hmm. then basically you should also know what kind of speaker you are connecting. No, because if you connect yeah. not correct speaker, then speaker, then you may get like different sound. Yeah. So uh, in the eighties and nineties, when people were making these giant towers of stereo equipment, um, they would, they would buy a separate equalizer and play with it all night to, to make it fit to the room. And, and today, if you buy an active loudspeaker, for instance, quite often they come with a, a little microphone and you put the microphone somewhere in your room and you tell the DSP to make it linear. So it, it plays white noise or a series of tones measures with the microphone, the, uh, the response, not of the speaker, but of your room as well. And it corrects for the, for the, the resonances and the nonlinearities of your room. And, um, those are, those are of course, things that without algorithms, you wouldn't be able to do. Can you really like hear difference? I'm just curious. Yeah. Is it worth um, the money? Yeah, yeah. So, um, 
room correction is something you have to be very, very careful with. Um, in the beginning, it, it got a really bad reputation because people would literally put the microphone in one spot. They would do a frequency sweep and they would do whatever they could to make the frequency uh, sweep flat again. And you have to be very careful because um, imagine, imagine you have a room like this and you have exactly a standing wave that, that fits one wavelength in the room. And you put the microphone exactly in the middle of this waveform the microphone would would respond uh, would, would record a very low amplitude because it's it's at mm -hmm. this uh, not point in the middle so the microphone would then um, determine that it needs to add i don't know 40 db of amplitude whereas if you would put the microphone at one quarter of the room it would measure the maximum of the standing wave at that frequency and it would gain it down so um room response is, is a very tricky question where you you algorithmically can measure the room but then you have to add a lot of um knowledge about acoustics that that you have to let's say measure in many different positions so these algorithms tell you put the microphone on the floor put it on the ceiling for a moment run around with the microphone make sure you have very diverse recordings and then they will analyze that in, in some regions all these these measured curves will overlap so there's really something wrong with your room in other regions the, the curves will have a very wide variance which means that depending on frequency it's either too loud or too low so there is really nothing so they, you can do. They at will that point. tell you where you should sit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, I've, I've developed a couple of these algorithms, and the first one I did um, was absolutely perfect in in the, the space of one centimeter. You could move your ear by one centimeter, and it would be all wrong. So, really? Um, yeah. First, can I decided you hear, like, to this different. Yeah. First, first I decided to screw my my chair into the floor, but then later on I realized that I should probably develop a better algorithm. Uh, okay, let's go back to this one. When you yeah. double click on the on the big panel, what is inside? Um, here's here's not so much inside. So here you see the uh, because I would like to the, understand the settings because of how did yeah. you set that for uh, low um, for quiet? Uh, yeah, so sound? We we're going up in in abstraction all the time, right? So in in the previous example, we had um, a low pass and a high pass filter, and this one integrates. Um, the low, low and shelving high? and the okay. high shelving. Mm -hmm. So here it has the frequency. I think it's set to 60 and 14K. Um, and those are, again, the frequencies from the Fletcher Munson curves. And there's a button here where you can give an offset. So you can add like 96 to the 60 or add some percentage to the 14K. Mm -hmm. And here is the, uh, the, the slew rate, which is a setting of how quickly it adapts to changes mm -hmm. in, in the level detector. So, mm -hmm. Um, if you would if you would deconstruct this block and think back in the in the previous example where we had uh, independent filtering, it would just be a shelving filter on a low pass and a shelving on a high pass. But, um, the, but, now the, they, but the value would be different for different amplitude. Exactly. So um, this this block comes straight from the library, but inside it is a low pass is a low shelf and a high shelf. And the values change all the time depending on the input. Mm -hmm. So th there's a block of code that takes in the number here, rewrites these coefficients, and then applies it to the audio signal. Mm -hmm. now, unfortunately, they, they don't show you the the exact inner workings, but that's that's why we're building up slowly, right? So um, we had uh, linear filtering. Now we have level dependent filtering. Mm -hmm. And um, if you would if you would um, go up one more step. Um, you could also, depending on the level of the audio, and now it gets tricky. So depending on the level of the audio, you could change the level of the audio. So um, this, this is essentially what a compressor does. So if signals get louder, you would actually, um, let, let, let's say you're, you're watching a movie in the evening. You want actually the loud signals to be a little bit quieter and the quiet signals to be a little bit louder. So you can still understand the speech in the movie and, and you will the not have the music would be down. Exactly. And you will not have the neighbors uh, banging on the door because you're, you're playing explosions at 140 mm -hmm. dB or something. Mm -hmm. So now here we are taking the, uh, the instantaneous signal and we're doing an RMS peak halt. So we're looking at the envelope of the signal and the signal that comes out has, has no um, sign. It's, it's always positive. It just tells you the magnitude of the audio. And with the magnitude of the audio, we're now um, influencing the, the the level of filtering. Mm -hmm. But with the magnitude of the audio, you can also change the gain of the audio. 
And that's what's called a compressor. Okay, you have an example for this, I guess. Of course, I prepared one earlier, as people say. And um, this is um, basically on, on the level of uh, RMS audio. So that there's now no longer an envelope detector sitting on the side because it's, it's built into this block. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to understand that a compressor works in the RMS time domain. So um, it has what's called an XY transfer function. And you can show that on the graph here. Mm -hmm. and you and I talked about this before and you were very confused. So that's why I brought it back. Um, so on the X axis, there is the RMS um, input level. Input, so the signal okay. can, yeah, the signal can vary from absolute silence to let's say plus 20 dBV. Mm -hmm. And we're mapping it to what you would like to have on the output. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so Y is output, X is input. Yeah. If this would be a straight line, it would be a pure gain block with a gain of one. So, mm -hmm. um, so it would be like exactly same would be yeah. on the output, what is on the input. Exactly. So minus 20 dB in would be mm -hmm. minus 20 dB out, mm -hmm. zero dB in would be zero dB out. Mm -hmm. Now I have turned it down for zero dB to come to minus 40 dB output. So now the high explosions are, are no longer going up here, mm -hmm. but they're coming all the way down here. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing I've done is anything lower than minus 80 dB input is going to complete silence. Mm -hmm. So that would be if I'm using a microphone and in the back there is my fridge or the computer, these quiet sounds are now completely cut off. They are made silent. And in between there, we now have to define the, the transfer function of the RMS signal. So signals from minus 80 dB, we want to hear. And let's say that... Um, um, at, at, we, we could make it, let's say, linear, and that would be a 45 degree angle. So that would be something like this. This would be a pure gain. But instead of that, we're doing a little bit of expansion. So minus 80 comes out as uh, input comes out as minus 135 outputs so of silence, but minus 40 dB now comes out as minus 60 dB. So mm -hmm. in here, we have more than unity gain. So we're actually in an area of dynamic expansion. So over the over the, the span of, let's say, um, 25 dB or 30 dB of input signal, we've changed the output signal by, what, 60, 70 dB. Mm -hmm. So we have a more than unity gain. That's because these, these signals are all very quiet. And then when we move into, let's say, the last 20 dB, so let's say that you're recording with a microphone, <laughs> your signals would be between minus 40 and minus 10 dB. So this, this would really be the level of where somebody is talking. Mm -hmm. And we want, we want to make this, this voice level more or less constant, but you still need some dynamic range. So where we move from minus 40 to minus, let's say 10 dB of the input. So that's, that's 30 dB of input dynamics. The output only changes from minus 60 to minus 40. So only 20 dB, which means that we have compressed the dynamic range a little bit. And, and finally, when we go over minus 10 dB, we really say, okay, that's loud enough. No more changes in the output. So from minus 10 to all the way to plus 20 dB input, there's literally no change in the output. So we what, are limiting. What if we would like to make the quite a uh, little bit louder? If you want to make the, um, what do you mean exactly by the quiet Like part? for example, uh, what very often happen when I'm recording, yeah. then uh, sometimes when I'm talking normally, it's quiet, yeah. but sometimes yeah. I start talking like this and then it's yeah. very loud. But uh, so that's that's essentially this area. That's that's the compression area. So let's say that um, sounds lower than minus 80 dB. You're not really interested in. Um, but anything, let's say, from minus 60 dB to minus 20 to, to minus 10 dB is what you think your voice could be. So you mm -hmm. could be further away from the microphone or closer to the microphone. And you, you want that to be essentially the same level, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the way you oh, look at it, okay, it's always yeah, relative. So but you can say it will we're be taking the same, the... but it's, it is still uh, minus 40, no? Yeah. So um, 
that's that's essentially why here there's another game but i'll get to that in ah, a moment. So okay i understand you have to understand that all of this is relative so mm -hmm. saying that you take the loud part and make it quiet or saying that you take the quiet part and make it loud both means that you're compressing so mm -hmm. um, on this transfer function minus 60 now input comes exactly out as minus 60 to be on the output so that's that's actually quite nice so this this little graph is now referenced around minus 60 db because the input is exactly the same as the output mm -hmm. but now over the whole range of minus 60 to minus 10 db you have a change of only minus 60 to minus 40 db on the output mm -hmm. so things are now almost equally loud you can mm -hmm. make it completely equally loud that's when you make it flat mm -hmm. but you will find out that this is this is not very attractive so you need to have a little dynamic range variation until your signal becomes really loud and you say okay no more than this we just completely keep it flat mm -hmm. from here on and um because you have um reduced the dynamic range from this from this straight line um the result is always that because th this is intentional that the level of output dynamics is now reduced mm -hmm. right um so you could move this whole graph up and mm -hmm. then you would say that uh minus uh, 135 comes out as minus 80 so you would draw the line over here that's an that's one way to do it the other way to do it is say okay my uh, compression curve tops out at minus 40 db so i'm adding another makeup gain block of 40 db mm -hmm. which means this all just gets shifted up mm -hmm. so then at the end um zero db input will be zero db output okay i, I have a question yeah uh i not you going to lose some information when you make yes. it quieter and then put it absolutely yeah back? um compression is uh, if if you uh, would be a perfect audio file it would absolutely be a sort of destruction of the sound um and people will tell you that they will not tolerate anything that changes the dynamic range of the signal um but in reality this is not how it works so let's say that you're in an average listening room and you have a very, um, you have a completely uncompressed recording. So if, if you've ever been to a live concert, but without any electronics, you know how loud instruments can get. Like think of, think of a trumpet or something. These things can get really loud. Um, and at the same time, you want to hear the little hi-hat on the drums and what have you. There's a lot of dynamic variation. So now you put it on a record and you, you do no dynamic compression. And you play it in your listening room. So um, you're a nice guy. You don't want your neighbors at the door. So you play it at a normal level. And you will find out immediately that the little details in the music are now completely inaudible. Because you have traffic driving by your house. You have your fridge on. You have your computer on. There is background noise, right? So the background noise will now completely destroy the low-level information in the music. Um, and if you turn it up so that you can hear the low levels, now, now the trumpets and the drums will break your windows. Um, so what most people don't realize is that a normal living room um, or anything that, that you can play music and, and still, you know, not get arrested has a very low dynamic range. And producers of records, but also producers of podcasts, for instance, they want to make sure that these things can be played back in a normal environment and you will still be able to hear everything there is to hear. Um, and, and a podcast is an even better example because everybody listens to podcasts in the car and now you have a lot of background noise from your engine, from the road, from the rain. Um, if, you, if you don't level out the signals, people will be changing the volume up and down all the time to hear everything there is to hear without being annoyed by, by the loud parts. Mm -hmm. so, so because yeah, because when you record, I'm sorry for interrupting, okay. because when you record normally in a normal normal room right, like this, then sometimes yeah. you may talk a little bit quieter, sometimes a little bit louder. Yeah. And that's what you don't want to have in your car when you are listening. Exactly, exactly. And then oh. if you have two different microphones, one speaker is louder than the other and um, you you have to of course think about the compression it, with with the, the the listening room in mind um because you it, if you make a record and people will be listening to it on headphones or in a, in a special listening room you will do much less uh, compression 
But if you record a podcast or an interview or, um, and, and sometimes it's done on purpose, if you record a commercial, you, you literally just make the dynamic range almost zero to just be in the middle of people's ears and, and really make them hear your product. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is no setting for a compressor that is ideal for every situation. You always have to think about the situation that will be um, experienced in the playground, okay. in, in the playback environment. Yeah. I have a different question. So when we do it this way, like uh, we set it to minus 40 and then we mm -hmm. increase it by 40 dB, is it exactly the same as if we would uh, set this to zero and we wouldn't use the 40 dB? Um, in principle, yes. It, in reality, of course, you have to be a little bit aware of um, your, your representation. So if you're on a fixed point processor, every time you gain something down by 6 dB, you lose one bit of resolution. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it would be better to do it the other way around. You first add 40 dB, and then you would have mm -hmm. to have an intermediate representation with a few extra bits, because normally you, you cannot represent numbers over 0 dBFS. Um, and then you do your compression. But if you if you do 40 dB before, then you can go like over. You can go over. So then, then you would have to increase the word length, then do the compression, and then um, chop off the, the, the lower bits. So the um, best is set this graph to zero and don't use any... It, it, it really depends. So, um, gain. I, most of the DSPs that, that I've recently been programming on all of this signal representation is in floating point, and then it's it's really not uh, that relevant anymore because the, the representation of floating point is is thousands of decibels. Um, the only point where it becomes interesting, of course, is when you you have to go out of the DSP into a physical device like a D2A converter that only accepts fixed point. Um, on on any other D DSP, these kind of considerations are always something that you should in the, keep at the back of your head how the representation is in your particular DSP. Um, going back to the, to the filtering uh, example we saw earlier, if you add a peaking filter of 6 dB, you have to make sure that there is headroom for, for at least one bit. So um, many, many times in these algorithms, and, and I'm fairly sure Analog Devices does it in the background too, there is something um, keeping track of the gains throughout all the coefficients and saying, if we are about to overflow, we, we shift everything up by one bit. If we're about to underflow, we shift everything down by, by a number of bits. Um, luckily, in, in this environment, you don't have to care about that. The uh, analog devices takes care of it. But it's, it's one of the, uh, classically, it, it's one of the things that a DSP engineer does. So mm -hmm. It makes sure that you don't um, lose numerical representation and, and that you don't gain down a signal to, let's say, three bits of resolution and then gain it back up to 24 and your dynamic range will be only 18 dB. Mm -hmm. So that's that's on the implementation side. So, but it means ideally you would like to set this graph to zero, correct? Not like minus 40, but zero and don't use this. Um, yeah, well, if, if, if I shift this whole thing up to zero, um, the problem is if I do this limiting part, mm -hmm. um, and, and we're looking at the, the RMS uh, amplitude right now. So the RMS amplitude means that over a certain number of samples, the DSP takes oh. the average and then says it's zero dB. But oh. the instantaneous amplitude can be over that, right? So you need a little bit of headroom to be able to detect that. This is why when I set the limiter to, I don't know, minus 13 dB, mm -hmm. it never really worked. Like you, you don't see signal going only up to minus 13 dB. It can go yeah. also a little bit yeah. higher. Yeah, and, and we'll measure this, this in a moment um, because if you want to measure a compressor or, or verify that it works, there are two things you have to do. So all this time we've been talking about RMS amplitudes and um, an RMS amplitude by mathematical definition means that you integrate the signal over a while and you know, it's, it's up to the DSP engineer to, to figure out what a while is. Um, in, in, in the case of compressors, usually what people do is they make it a multi-band compressor where you take a longer integrating time for the base signals. And so essentially you pre-filter the signal and you run it um, through four band separated compressors and you add it back up. But um, 
in, in this example, we just have to look at the signal for a while to determine the RMS amplitude. So mm -hmm. you sum up all the samples and divide by the number of samples. Uh, you sum up the square of all the samples, divide by the number of samples and take the square root. But yeah, in the beginning, um, or, or even in, in a steady state, the instantaneous amplitude can be higher than the RMS amplitude. Mm -hmm. But also, um, only when you've determined the RMS amplitude, can you actually apply this, this table. So you have to integrate a number of samples, then you work out, okay, the amplitude was minus 20 dB. I want to go to minus 35 dB. So therefore my gain should be um, minus 15 dB, and mm -hmm. then you apply it. So there will always be um, a reaction time because uh, the signal comes in from an external device uh, unless you have what's called a, a look ahead compressor where you, you um, can integrate the signal before uh, it arrives or you, you can read ahead. But if you can't, the signal comes in um, and only when it goes over the threshold, you know that, oh, now I have to do something. And um, that's why there are times uh, in this block, so one of them is the uh, the RMS time constant, and there's a hold time and there's a decay time. So standard compressors, they have what's called ADRS, attack, decay, um, okay. ADRS, no, no, ADSR, sorry, attack, decay, sustain, and release. Mm -hmm. So imagine, and, and we'll measure this in a moment, imagine that a burst comes in. So the signal has been quiet all the time, and your compressor is sitting there like gaining everything down to minus 135 dB. And then a loud signal comes in and the compressor integrates this for a while and then determines the RMS amplitude and goes, oh, I have to bring the gain down because we are in the compression or even in the limiting range. So then it reacts and the signal goes down. Then that signal stays for a while. So that's, that's then, um, so you have attacked, um, reduced the gain. You can even have a decay where you then let the gain come up a little bit again. And then on the sustain part, you, you now have a steady state gain as long as your signal is in that range. And then um, in, in the example of a burst signal, the amplitude drops to, to uh, minus 135 dB again. So now you have to bring the gain back up and that's called the release time. And um, these, these are, again, parameters that are psychoacoustically defined and they are um, a compromise. So it, it's something that an acoustic engineer so what will... What is the compromise? Because ideally yeah. you would like to uh, react uh, as soon as possible, no? But exactly. I guess there are there is something... something yeah, that's a very clever it. question. <laughs> so um, you, you want to uh, react as soon as possible, but you cannot get the RMS value of one sample. So you, yeah. you have to integrate over some time and whatever some time means is, is related to the bandwidth of the signal that you're compressing. So if you're, if you're compressing base signals, let's say at 20 Hertz, you need to integrate at least 50 milliseconds to make sure you capture one full sine wave, mm -hmm. right? So, um, your attack time can be no less than 50 milliseconds, because mm -hmm. if you attack faster, you literally are um, destroying the first half of a sine wave while it's still progressing. But if you do it too slowly, then you will, you will get this typical pumping effect that, that you know from, from bad music, you know, where if a bass drum comes in, you feel that all of the signal is now falling down because the, the bass drum triggers the compressor to gain everything down. Um, the, 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 there's a rap music that does this on purpose, but it, it literally is just a badly tuned compressor. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the compromise is to, to find the right time. And, and one of the ways people do this is instead of using one compressor, they use four. So they split the signal in four frequency bands, um, run optimized compressors with optimized time constants for each, and then add it back up. That's called a multi-band compressor. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's have a look on the signals. Yeah. So can so, we do it like for this, um, for this one, and then when mm -hmm. we move it up to zero, and can we see some yeah. difference? We can do that. So let's send this to the board. So we have to do two measurements now. Um, let me get the compressor. Can you leave the audio then on? I would like to hear the measurement, how it is doing. Yeah, we can do that. So first we do the RMS level. So we're using a step level sweep. 
Well, we're stepping, uh, we're starting at minus 100 dB. It can start even lower, but we will just be measuring noise. And the stop level will be 0 dB, because if I go any higher, then the signal will just clip. Um, so again, you're looking at the RMS domain. So it's RMS level in dBV versus the generated level also in dBV. Mm -hmm. RMS level I've, is the output. Yeah. yeah. And even though I've got the audio on, you barely hear anything right now because it will be very quiet and it becomes louder and louder. You could hear it was clipping a little bit there. So um, this, this really low level we've seen here is essentially cut off because it, it just drowns in the noise. But you can see this uh, expansion level um, mm -hmm. that, or, or more or less linear level that we had here. Mm -hmm. And then you see around minus 60 mm -hmm. dB, you literally see it kink. And, and mm -hmm. that's exactly the 60 dB that we implemented here. And then we go into the compression level. Oh. And that's this part over here until about minus 5 dB, and then it starts to go flat. So we literally have measured this mm -hmm. curve now. And there is uh, the plus uh, 40 dB, so that's why there is zero. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and then the second thing you have to check is, of course, your, your attack and release time. So um, if you don't have an audio uh, precision, you would, you would need a burst signal generator, do it with a sound card or something. Um, and if you if you run a burst, you have no signal, then you have full signal, and then you have no signal again. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where you, you see how it responds. So let's do that. See so it go very low, very loud. And then quiet and see how it comes back. So, and here it's plotting the RMS um, signal over time. So you see that at some point, there, um, there was some signal, and it was in a steady state, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's it's at some point in the in, in the compression curve. Then um, let, let's look at the maybe at the, the quiet signal first. So it's playing a, a silent sign of or a quiet sine wave, and then it's playing a very loud burst, and then it's going back. So this signal here is actually the same mm -hmm. as this, but the compressor has modified it. So. Mm -hmm. um, the RMS envelope of the signal goes up, and here you see the compressor attacking it. So mm -hmm. it was going to go to, I don't know, mm -hmm. almost so zero the attacking dB. is only like very quick. Or yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, usually the attack time constant is, is something around 5, 10 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So it's it's quickly reducing the, attitude, uh, the, the amplitude. Um, some compressors do a little bit of over reduction and then come back. So that's the attack decay thing. This, this one just does attack. And now it's happy. So it, it has the, the signal at the level where it should be. And um, it, it found the right level. And now suddenly the signal completely disappears. Mm -hmm. And um, the compressor goes, oh, hang on, the signal is now over here. So I don't need to put in all this negative gain. I can ramp the gain back up to the normal position. And this is then the release time. And as you compare it to the attack time, it's, it's much, much, much longer. Mm -hmm. So it takes literally three seconds to come back, and you and can see it you in the sign in, your, uh, in the block, what are the settings in the block in in the? Um, so here it has a decay time of ten dB per second. So um, instead of one one number for the whole uh, decay, analog devices expresses it in in uh, seconds in dB per mm -hmm. second. So uh, let's see. This is in dB, so we come back from 36 dB to minus 18 dB. So that's um, that's actually 18 uh, dB, am I correct? Uh, 28, 36. Yeah, it's, it's 18 dB. And it does 10 dB per second. So let's see, we're at 36. Here we're roughly, now we're a little bit over 26. So it, it should have come back in two seconds. It takes two and a half. Mm -hmm. um, it, it could you know, it could be that the algorithm has measured. So if you change ten it. to yeah. one, for example, then it would be much faster. Yeah. So let's let's do that. Let's change it to one. So 
No, actually, I'm stupid. I've changed it to 1 dB per second, so okay, now it comes back slower. much slower, right? So we need to do it the other way around. We make, need to make it 100 dB per second. Yeah, it will take that. So now it should be uh, almost instantaneous. But now the problem is it will only work with some kind of frequencies correctly and... Yes, so... Um, the, the the burst test of course is uh, is is the one thing you can measure but um, to really tune a compressor you you need to have some acoustic uh, experience and and just if you if you find that your compressor is pumping and reacting to crazy signals there are things you can do you can make it a multiband compressor you can even take um, the signal that it, it responds to and filter that separately that's called sideband filtering so then your compressor um, reacts only on a part of the frequency. So let's imagine you have a microphone and um, there is wind noise and the wind noise is overwhelming the microphone and it's changing the gain. And now whenever there's wind, my voice goes down. So what you do then is the signal that goes to the compressor to, to change the gain, you high pass filter that so that the wind doesn't control the compressor anymore. Uh, okay, so do you have some other examples? Um, yeah, well, I, I have one more file. I'm not sure if it makes sense going through, but... Uh, oh, oh we, we wanted yeah. to move this up. I, I wanted oh, yeah. to... Yeah. I wanted to see the difference. So let's say we move no, no, this... No, no, put it on up. zero and, and just... Uh, oh, sorry. Zero, yeah. Yeah. There we go. And we need to put also... Yeah. These need to go up a little bit as well. No, that doesn't want to move any further. So, okay, on. and makeup gain. You have to change the makeup gain. Yeah. I'm not sure what's wrong with the audio precision. It does that sometimes. Let me, let me restart that. Suddenly, it outputs noise. Just because you pay twenty twenty thousand doesn't mean you get good software, of course. It's always like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, more complicated things. Uh, they, they, yeah, they, they changed their, their model now. Every year they're making an upgrade of the software for 1,000 euros. So they they clearly see the software as uh, the thing to make money from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's no, totally happy then. Yeah, but disable the uh, gain. Yeah, oh, that's right. It probably did that in real time, yeah. See? You know more about audio than me. No, I no, I just would like to see the difference. Yeah. No, and the, and the put, noise, their, put their the DK10 back to 10 so we can yeah. see it. But the noise I was hearing on the microphone was because we now moved this table up and there was still 40 dB of gain, so... I was listening to the input noise and not the audio position. So now it should be roughly the same. And first we measure then the steady state again. These these little T lines is when the signal is a bit too noisy and the the AP isn't entirely sure about it, but don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. So this is almost the same now, right? It's a little, so little bit the, different because the, uh, there was... It, yeah, nine, it could be. Or maybe could you move the change, graphic yeah, to exactly. oh, minus four, okay. Yeah. But it still ends at um, 0 dB FS, uh, 0 mm -hmm. dBV, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the attack and release should also be roughly the same. We know that that should be here. So in this case, there is no difference if we... No. And that's probably because the people from Audio Precision know that they are responsible for um, doing the gain management and the noise floor management, um, especially because this is supposed to be a graphical, you know, no, uh, no code environment. Mm -hmm. But the, the other graph is different. Can you go back? This one and the 
Yeah, this is different. So we changed this to 10 dB per decade. Well, the, because it was of the minus difference, 18 before, yeah, I think. Because of the different curve, because in the beginning, I think we were doing something more like this. I was trying to make this line, yeah, this line I was trying to make go vertical. But you mm -hmm. see that I'm trying to pull this point up and it, it just won't do it. Mm -hmm, because, so it, okay. Previously, we were coming up very strong and then doing a lot of compression. And this point will just not come up further. So we have a different XY transfer point and transfer curve, which means that the signal is falling down less in amplitude. And therefore, it's releasing quicker. It's actually overshooting and then falling back. So maybe that's the difference. That's why you would like to put everything lower, because then you can better manipulate with the points. I prefer to do it that way, yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand. And, that. and the, um, um, the 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 recording deck that you showed me also had a makeup gain, I think. Uh, I'm I'm curious uh, because sometimes I have to adjust the uh, audio, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm sometimes like worried, like. Uh, for example, I add audio plus, let's say, 20 decibels, mm -hmm. and then I need to put it back uh, by minus 10 decibels. Is yeah. it? That's probably not a good way to do it. Better would be just put it up to 10 decibels, correct? Well, um, if, it, if it's all synthetic audio, there would be um, a case where you say, okay, the audio is quantized to, let's say, 24 bits, so your noise floor is minus 144 dB. Now you add 20 dB of gain, so all the signals of minus 144 dB come up to minus uh, 124 dB, so you, you um, make your quantization noise more audible. Um, at the same time, at, at the, the high end, some bits will fall out because to, to, you have to stay in your representation range. And if you now gain it back down, You've, you've essentially gained up the noise and gained down the noise, but you've, um, you've, you've, you've thrown away some dynamic range. But I think in practice, um, it's noise, noise floors will be, will be dominated by your room noise and all that. So, mm -hmm. um, so in reality, you, it's not like big deal. Not anymore. So now that we have 24 bits, um, you, you can gain up and down quite a few times before it before it becomes really bad. So mm -hmm. back in the 80s, when, when you had 16 bits, um, you had to be really careful about that. And especially in, in studios, when they're doing digital mixing, th this is one of the reasons why CDs from the 80s have a bad reputation, because they, they were gaining stuff up and down. When they are gaining back down, and you have to chop off, let's say, four bits at the end of the word, because you're going into the 20th LSB, but you only have 16 LSBs, they would simply cut off the words and then the rounding errors um, would simply um, be, be truncated and, and not rounded in any proper way. Mm -hmm. And if you imagine, for instance, a sine wave is a very predictable signal, um, you would then have rounding errors that are correlated mm -hmm. to the signal. So your, your rounding error would also be a multiple of the sine wave. And in order to prevent that, there's a technique called dithering where literally right before you cut off the last few digits, you're adding random noise with the amplitude of half of one LSB. Mm -hmm. And um, even though you're adding noise, now the, the quantization error, which is, which is one half of an LSB, is completely decorrelated from the noise, uh, from mm -hmm. the signal, because it's, it's noisified, essentially. Mm -hmm. that, that's what dither is for. And every time mm -hmm. you, you change the audio um, up and down and you save it in an intermediate format, so you, you can gain up and down as long as you want, but when you save it like that, um, or um, when you transcode something, you should make sure that you dither the uh, the saved audio. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when it was uh, 16 bit, then what was the noise floor? Um, the noise floor is 16 times 6 at that point, so minus 96 dB. Mm -hmm. um, and and now would... with 24? It's, it's minus 144, but that's that's always assuming that the um, the, the 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 rounding, so, so the error on the last LSB is completely, let's say, uh, white noise or thermal or random. Mm -hmm. So, um, if it comes from another signal format and it has been converted, 
and it's not been properly dithered, then it, it's possible to, um, and this is quite cool actually, it's possible to hear signals that are as far as 20 dB below the noise floor. Just because they are repetitive in motion and if you just analyze a, uh, a signal long enough, you take 1000 FFT averages, you will find these coherent signals below the noise floor. Hmm. Interesting. But yeah. in reality, you don't hear minus two, 100. 20. In, in reality, it's the year 2022 and, and, and there is no more really bad software or really bad audio workstations. Um, but when you are coding something yourself, or you're writing a DSP algorithm or you're doing this conversion, then you have to bear in mind that you have to decorrelate your conversation mm -hmm. noise from the signal. Mm -hmm. How, how quite signal normally you can hear? Um, so in, in a really good listening uh, room, I think you can detect signals. Well, let, let's put it the other way down. If you, if you do a hearing test, you will be able to hear signals down to about 20 dB SPL, right? So, um, or actually the, the zero dB SPL is defined as the hearing threshold. So if you're really good, um, that's, that's the, the theoretical answer, but that's really no answer. So the absolute hearing threshold is zero dB SPL. In practice, you can hear in a good quiet room, about 20 dB. Um, I think over here it's about 35 because I live on a very um, loud road. Um, but um, so, so that's the absolute hearing threshold of things in, in absence of other noise. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we compare this uh, to these other scales, what we are talking about, because when I'm adjusting audio, for example, mm -hmm. I adjust the audio to level minus 13 dB. So what does 13 it... dB FS on, on, on the digital scale, you mean? FS? No, I don't know what it yeah. is. <laughs> so, um, the decibel literally is, is just um, a, a, it's not even a unit. It, it just means a ratio, right? So 20 dB means that something is 10 times louder yeah. than something else in, in the, in the voltage domain, not in the power domain. So, um, a dB, um, is, is a relative thing. And to make it absolute, you always have to specify it's relative to something. So the RF people always talk about dBm that's dBs to a millivolt. So 20 dBm would be 20 milli, uh, would be 10 millivolt. Um, in, in acoustics, when you, when you talk about loudness in your room, you talk about dB SPL, and that is the number of dBs that you measure, um, one meter away from a loudspeaker. And that's, that's the sound pressure level. And I think studios, um, train their, their engineers and, and, um, set up their, their gear so that, um, mixing is done at roughly 86 dB SPL. Um, so coming back to zero dB SPL is the absolute threshold. 30 dB is, is roughly room background noise. 50, 60 dB is a conversation. 80 dB is just a, a music piece playing, even acoustically. I think 100 dB SPL is an airplane. 120 is a fighter jet. 140 uh, is what when your ears start uh, being actually damaged. So that that's the reference for that dB. In the, in the digital domain, when we're talking about signals inside a, a mixing desk, we reference everything to full scale. So there's dBFS and you can go no further than zero dBFS. So anything higher than zero dBFS literally means you're, you're trying to write the number two in a, a format that can only accept zeros between zero and one. So everything higher than zero dBFS will be clipped or distorted or wrapped around, you don't even know until you know your algorithm. So inside DSP algorithms like this, you, you have to stay below zero dBFS. It's, it's the brick wall. Mm -hmm. Okay. I understand now. So, and, and so if you, you if you go that's... above zero, then, uh, it means yeah. you are kind of damaging your signal. Yeah, you, you run the risk of damaging your signal. And, and when you decide to stay around minus 10, minus 13 dB of S, that, that is also my experience that lets you, you know, um, have a little bit of, of, um, overshoot in your compressor before it attacks. So you will have momentary peaks, maybe down to, to minus two, minus three dB, and you will be perfectly fine playing with the rule of thumb to, to keep it at minus 10, minus 15 dB of S. Um, the other thing you can do, of course, is you, you buy a meter that tells you not only the RMS level, 
which you're trying to keep around minus 13 dB of S, but it also tells you your peak levels. And if you see that your peak levels regularly go to, to minus 1, minus 0 0.5, or even minus 0, then you know that you're playing with fire, you should probably back off a little bit. But usually all these graphs, even now, what I see, mm -hmm. they go maybe also a little bit higher, or no? Oh no, there is zero. Oh, yeah. you are right. Yeah. So again, don't don't forget this is this is the RMS. Um, but um, signals have peaks, and and the peak level you can you can express in dB, even though um, mm -hmm. dB sort of uh, assumes that it's an RMS signal. But yeah. You can um, you can have a signal that has an RMS level of minus three dB of S, but the peaks can be it can be very much clipped because they they've gone over zero dB of S. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and th then there's a little side um, discussion where if you if you would have a sine wave that goes exactly from rail to rail, um, there are groups of people who call that zero dB of S, and there are groups of people who call that uh, minus three dB of S because you could encode a louder signal between those rails that would be a square wave. So um, depending on who you talk to, 0 dB of S is the reference for a square wave of a si or a sine wave of exactly rail to rail um, minus 1 to plus 1 encoding level. So what is safe level then? I, I think you're doing great with, with minus 10, minus 15 dB of S. And again, it, it depends on what you're recording. If you're sitting in a room recording a podcast or an audiobook, you have a very well-controlled acoustic environment. You have a good microphone and all that. If you're walking on the street doing an interview, you probably want to stay around minus 20, 25 dB of S because you never know what happens. A plane might fly by or somebody might grab the microphone and shout inside. So um, it, it very much depends on the, on the application. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, do you have some other examples? Um, well, I think because we, we set all this thing up for uh, for compressors, of course, I, I can go into many different algorithms, but I think a compressor was uh, the nice example. I just wanted to show you um, the, 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 the full example of what you, the, the things you can do to make yourself sound absolutely perfect in a podcast. So I brought back the five EQs, so the, the high-low shelf, um, a peaking filter, maybe, you know, um, to, to um, let's say if you're Dave Jones, you want to boost the 400 hertz band a little bit to, to have a little bassier voice. Um, or you want to have a notch because um, you live in Australia and your voice is very much 2 kilohertz. Um, you can add a little high shelf to um, sharpen your S's. And then here is a compressor that really goes overboard. So this is a four band multi-band multi compressor. So you see how it's divided the whole audio band in one, two, three, four bands. Mm -hmm. And for every band, you can have a different mm -hmm. XY uh, transfer curve. Mm -hmm. I, I just randomly set something. So this is basically, for example, you could use this compressor specifically for speech. Yeah. One of them, I guess. But Well, actually, the multiband compressor, I think, would be better for music. For, for speech, you, you probably... One single compressor would be enough mm -hmm. um, because your speech is not like four or five octaves, right? It's uh, it's maybe two, three octaves. Mm -hmm. um, but if you if you are producing music, um, like like what I said earlier, so ah, okay. So for very you, have the drum you, would, going. you would have yeah. one for very loud. Uh... Well, you, you you would split it by by frequency. So the, the drums obviously fall in in compressor zero. Mm -hmm. The last thing you want is every drum transient to make the singer go down, you know, in, in she's singing and, and every drum beat would, would make her voice go down and it would take half a second to come back up. So that's that's called the pumping effect. That is super annoying. So you put a fairly aggressive compressor on band zero. So let's say that... Uh, this would be the same for a movie, for example, yeah? Or like, yeah, um... exactly. So you, you would, not, you would uh, bring the explosions down so you, you really cap it down. Then you have the lower voice band in one. And um, let me see if I I level this out at minus 20 dB. So probably should do the same here. But I would I would use far less compression because 
This is where you get room noises and all that. Maybe I would even leave it completely linear. Then you have the voice band. And um, we will actually bring it up a little bit with regards to the bass. So we were emphasizing the voice. Mm -hmm. um, but we put a bit of a noise gate in it. So um, really quiet sounds like, like, like whispers and, and papers and all that you, you really gain down. But then when somebody's talking, we really want quite some gain. This is the farthest I can go. Maybe if I bring this up, it will let me go a little bit further than that. So um, we, we put quite some compression in the voice, but also quite some gain. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, these quiet levels. And look, devices has decided I cannot go, go much further than mm -hmm. that. So we do something like this. And then the really high frequency areas, I would again pull them down a little bit because, um, I don't know, it would be bullets flying or something. Um, in, in the evening, you would, you would really not want all of the high frequencies to do. Um, it, it would even almost wake you up, right? So um, I've got a very nice round curve in here. And of course, now, now you understand that if you write your own algorithms, um, one of your inputs to your algorithm could be a real-time clock. And you could literally change these these curves around during the day. So mm -hmm. um, during the day, you would have far less compression than the evening and all that stuff. Huh. And um, that that's how you would set a multiband compressor. And then you you um, in in this evaluation board, you would probably be able to connect a microphone preamp and just talk through it and, and hear the difference. Um, now that, now that you know what all these controls do, you can do the same with your, um, what was it? Uh, not Steam Deck, but the... Uh... ATEM, I use ATEM. Yeah, you or, use the ATEM. Or, or yeah. in DaVinci, you can do it directly in post exactly. processing. Yeah, and, but now you see what all these controls do and you, you sort of have the, the signal, back, uh, signal processing background um, and you can make more educated guesses. And the other thing you can do literally is just make a copy of your profile and select one parameter and, and go completely nuts, make it extreme, see how it overreacts, turn it extreme the other way, and, and then you figure out what's what's going to be a, a good compromise. Um, but you have to bear in mind that there is always a little bit of interdependence between these things. So if you make a very strong compression profile, but you set your attack time um, way too late, then there will be very little compression because by the time a, a transient happens, um, but by the time you've attacked it, it's already gone. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the controls are not fully orthogonal. You, you really need to understand what happens inside the algorithm. And you need to hear the difference. Uh... Of course you need to hear the difference. Yeah. But, yeah. um, if, if it doesn't sound right and you don't know what to do, then of course you, you're not making progress. So I, I hope that now that you understand a little bit what happens inside, um, you will be able to make more more targeted progress. I have one more question. I don't know if you will know answer, but uh, what about uh, noise? Uh, about the active noise cancellation? You know, I'm just curious. Uh, mm -hmm. So is it really like there are like microphones? For example, when you have headphones, yeah, there are like microphones and and they play the same sound, but the opposite direction or opposite yeah. uh, amplitude or something? Yeah, I, I can't tell you a lot about specific algorithms because I've, I've worked on many of them. So, um, of course, there's a bit of confidentiality, but um, the principle is very simple. So, um, obviously, you have some noise that is bothering you and you're trying to figure out where the noise comes from. So. Uh, in the example of a car, in the beginning, people thought it was the engine. So what you do is you put a microphone on the engine and you put a microphone at the, the place where the, 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 um, the people in the car are. And you record the acoustic properties of the engine and you record it at the listener position. And what you figure out is, of course, there's, there's a propagation function. Um, so the amplitude has changed, the frequency response has changed. You can just determine roughly a transfer function. Um, and and you, can, you can model it fairly linearly that there's a frequency response, there's an amplitude response. You don't do anything nonlinear. And then what you do is you, you take that as a starting point and you, you understand that this transfer function will change over time and, and, and um, over temperature and all that. So 
the one thing you cannot do is literally record the engine sound. Um, you, you've measured one transfer function, so you take the recording from the engine sound, you apply the transfer function, and then you apply a minus one and you, you play it from the speakers and all the sound will disappear. It, it, it's not that simple. So knowing that it changes a little bit, you take the, 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 the determined transfer function and um, you measure again at the beginning, at the end, and you try to uh, invert the noise from the engine. You don't exactly achieve it, so you come up with an error function. And then um, you build an algorithm that tries to minimize the error function. Mm -hmm. So it recorded the engine sound, it played it back at the listener, but the microphone at the listener says there's still some sound left. So the error function goes back in and you're trying to find the gradient of the error function to a minimum. So you, you change the, the estimate of the, of the transfer function from microphone to the ear and you iterate. So now you play another piece and your error function is a little bit better. And then you iterate again and again and again. And the, the whole crux of the matter is trying to find that local minimum. Um, and, and you have to imagine this, you can imagine it as a two dimensional space and it, it has a local minimum. In reality, these are usually functions that are like 18 dimensional. And, and trying to visualize that breaks my brain. So I always visualize it as a simple one or two dimensional minimum. And um, then it becomes control theory. So if you take two big steps, you risk overshooting the minimum. Mm -hmm. If you take two small steps, you never get there. So there's a lot of tweaking in the algorithm then how you iterate towards the minimum and how you guarantee that there is a, a stable solution and, uh, and, and that you're not trying to optimize for a local minimum when there's a global minimum somewhere else. And, and yeah, that's, that's essentially applying uh, um, control theory. So it, it's control theory married to acoustics. So it doesn't really work. You can cancel the yeah. sound well, by just playing the exactly. opposite one. Exactly. Um, cancellation is, of course, is a very brave word. Um, <laughs> I think A and C actually stands for acoustic noise control. Um, because bear in mind, if you remove 99% of all the sound, what you will actually measure is a reduction by 20 decibels, right? And, and if the sound was 80 decibels before, and it ends up at 60, and you say to people, this is noise cancellation, they're, they're not very impressed. Well, I can still hear it. Yeah, but you hear only 1%. The problem, of course, is, again, our ears are, are more logarithmic than linear. So psychoacoustically, people are not super impressed with only 99% reduction. They, they want 100%. And that's, that's yeah, an asymptote that's unachievable. Uh, we didn't talk about limiter much. So how does limiter work? So let's go back to um, to the measurement here. So when, when you look at these RMS levels, um, you see that at, at some point I can increase the input signal, but the output doesn't increase. And that's, that's one way of limiting the signal that literally is applying infinite compression. So that still works in the RMS domain. You measure the signal for a while, you see that it's trying to be too loud and you, you bring it back down. Um, and, and you could call that soft limiting. Then there is another way and that's, that's hard limiting. And that's literally if signal is over limit, signal is limit. So if it would be a sine wave, you would literally just completely chop the, chop the top of the sine wave. But then you would like damage the sound. Yeah. You know? You are damaging the sound. Um, I, I do have an example from, I think the very first, uh, this one. Ah, soft clip. Yeah. So this, this is a limiter um, that's trying, well, it, it will still chop off the signal, but it's trying to be gentle about it. So here's an example, very simple example. The signal goes in, we're gaining it by one, and then it comes right back out. So I can see that I can put one volt RMS into the A to D converter through the algorithm and it comes out again, um, just about unclipped. So here so on the it's a little bit higher, 1.2. Um, it's one volt RMS. Ah, okay. okay. The I peaks understand. are 1.2. So 
You have to take the peaks and divide them by the I square root of two, right? I keep forgetting yeah. it. <laughs> and it, it's really important to see the, the difference between instantaneous and RMS. Um, so now, if I would gain this by 1.5, uh, you'll see it now is not completely clipped. So this is what you call hard clipping. Signals mm -hmm. over a certain level are simply clipped to the level because going into there the is no information converter, about yeah there, there's nothing you can it, do and yeah. in the in, in the fft you now see that essentially you start to get the fft of a square wave mm -hmm. right so um if i if i turn this on you can hear that's that's not a tone that's got many of these overtones and all of the uh, odd orders are very high the even orders are a little bit suppressed because it's somehow still symmetric but yeah this this is not ideal so then um, here's a, a soft clipping block and it now tries to clip around 10, which of course is way too high. So let's see if I bring that down to 1.5, which is exactly the gain I've got. Mm -hmm. And I go back to the signal here. You see, it's now starting to round off the edges. Mm -hmm. So we're still absolutely running into a hard wall here, but just before you do, this soft clipper is just bending the signal a little bit. And all of the harmonics, all, all the higher harmonics are gone, so it, it sounds better too as well. It, it's still not a great signal, but you know, all the sharpness has gone. And if I reduce the amplitude, now it's turning into a proper tone again. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what a soft clipper does. Um, the, the other way to, to do um, the clipping is to literally, in your compressor, make sure that the signal never goes this high. So um, you would make the, the XY transfer curve completely flat, and um, it would clip for a moment during the attack phase. And then the compressor sees, oh my god, you're going way too high, and it would gain down the signal. So, so th this was my question, like, is this yeah. limited uh, using like different algorithm, like it's much faster it, re it reacts much faster or um well Light. this 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 limiter is instantaneous because it, it literally just reduces the signal as soon as it gets into into the the supply rail so mm -hmm. um it's an instantaneous algorithm it just uh, calculates the distance between the signal and 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 the absolute limit mm -hmm. and it's it's um literally trying to reduce this distance so so as uh, closer uh, the signal goes to the limit then yeah. uh, it's kind of uh, putting it lower and lower and lower and lower. Exactly. Yeah. So you mm -hmm. you can essentially figure out how you how you calculate this. You do this. So this is this, better this than this minus this. So this should be used before the compressor then, because compressor can be a little bit late. Yeah. So you can. Yeah. Um, it, it depends on where you use it. So if if you're going into something with a hard limit, um, so let's go back to the differences. This this clipper is um, modifying the signal in, in a way. So you can see that there's a second order harmonic because this doesn't even look like a sine wave anymore. That's the downside because it, it is, you know, changing the signal, but it's impossible for it to overshoot because it, it works instantaneously on every sample. Um, whereas a compressor would keep this clean sine wave, it would just gain the whole sine wave down and you would, you would not see this uh, second and third harmonic because it would still be a very clean sine wave. But in the beginning, it would overshoot a little bit until the compressor can attack. Um, so again, it depends on the application. So mm -hmm. a compressor that has infinite compression works as a limiter, but it, um, it, it, in the beginning, it, it has to overshoot and, and uh, distort a little bit temporarily before it, uh, it finds the right attack level. Whereas this kind of limiter is instantaneous, but it sort of kind of destroys the signal slowly. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it depends entirely on your application, which one you use. And uh, of course, this one is, is the fail safe, right? So, oh, okay. Uh, so maybe if you use compressor first and yeah. then you use this limiter, then this limiter will only kind of limit the very short time, yeah. which was not yeah. catched by exactly. the comp compressor. Yeah. So that's, that's even a, like much better than using limiter before because you could damage like whole. Yeah, that, that's entirely okay. correct. So and anywhere where you have signals that, that are, you know, random and 
if you have deterministic signals, then there's no need for signal processing. So signals should always be considered random. Um, it, it's the same as in programming. You have to safeguard your in and outputs. So um, if the signal goes through a point with, with um, fixed point limitations uh, or a voltage limitation, like an A to D or a D to A converter, you want to protect it. Um, but uh, th this is literally like the, the final protection. This, this mm -hmm. is essentially a crowbar for audio signals, if mm -hmm. you will. And uh, that's everything. Thank you very much to Remco for helping me to create this video. And thank you very much to you for watching. By the way, we are preparing some very interesting tutorials. So if you don't want to miss them, hit the subscribe button. If you want, you can also check out our Fedevel online courses where you will find everything important from basic board design up to advanced hardware design and PCB layout. The link is in the description. That's all for this video. Thank you again. Don't forget to leave your comments and see you next time. Bye.